start with Naomi, so I'm going to share the screen and we're going to do a bit of a tag team here, but um, Naomi, I'll pass over to you to start the presentation. Thanks very much, Kim. So my name is Naomi Martin, the Sustainability Manager for Construction at Mervac, and Kim will introduce herself, but she's the amazing resource recovery manager of operations, also known as a waste whisperer within <laughs> Mervac because of her amazing skills at managing um, resources within Mervac. We're going to talk about um, Mervac's approach to uh, planet positive uh, waste and materials. So just an um, introduction to Mervac. Mervac's a top um, 50 ASX listed company. It's um, a diversified and integrated model, which has been a real asset for us as we have gone on this journey on how to make a circular uh, strategy to, to do with waste and materials. So by integrated, we mean we develop, we design, we construct and also operate buildings and so have opportunities to influence um, on all those areas. So Mervac's very committed to, uh, to sustainability and we have our This Changes Everything sustainability strategy, which focuses on the areas where we can make the most impact and um, do the most good. So there's two environment, two social and two community uh, targets. The one that we're talking about today, obviously is within natural resources and it's our zero waste to landfill by 2030 um, target that was set um, a several years ago now. So the target was set, but we'd never really articulated how we were gonna to get to zero waste by 2030. And so on June 30, we released Planet Positive Waste and Materials. And so this document outlines our approach to get to zero waste to 2030. But we also, rather than just looking at that end goal, which um, has been spoken about by Jackie and Jacko as well, that we're looking also at how we can make a more circular approach to that and um, look at the whole of life of materials as well. And also importantly, focus on the points of influence in our integrated model that we can actually affect. We can't affect everything. So let's just focus on the things we can. So in terms of why materials and uh, waste is important to Mervac, uh, we collect uh, waste, operational waste from $22 billion worth of properties across Australia. We spend a lot of money around 15 million per year on waste and that, that cost is increasing each year. And importantly, while we're going through this process, we realise we also spend one billion on materials each year. So if we're looking at the place where we can have a real influence, it's kind of sort of a light bulb moment for a lot of us that this is really important in terms of closing that gap as well. We create a lot of waste, 23, um, almost 24,000 tonnes in operations and 14,000 tonnes in construction. Um, and, you know, with, you know, and we're working to increase our recycling rates as much as possible. But Planet Positive goes past just, you know, um, the number of tonnes to landfill and how much our recycling rates are. And it's got seven key strategies, it's, uh, which we're not going to talk through each, each of the seven. All of them are important, but we're going to talk about the ones that we've progressed a bit more. And like Jackie was saying, you know, there is an end goal of circularity, but there is a lot of things you can do along the way. And so we're going to try and give some tangible examples of what we've been doing along the way in materials focused design, uh, innovative construction, efficient, responsible operation, and also collaboration. So strategy one, material focused design. So this is one of those principles that Jackie talked about in designing out waste in the first place. And so we're gonna continue, Mervac has been investing in design for manufacture and assembly, off, you know, offsite, design for offsite prefabrication essentially. Um, and we're, so we're gonna just focus more on that um, going forward. And we're also doing some pilot projects. So I'll go through those now. So design for manufacturing assembly is such a great opportunity because it's a win-win for both the business and for the environment in terms of reducing waste. We've found through, for example, um, designing bathrooms to be more optimized, so less variety, but more standard, has allowed us to do bathroom pods. So uh, bathrooms that are manufactured offsite in a factory, brought to site, you can see um, coming those pods coming on a factory, then lifted up into place and installed. It saves heaps of time, for example, um, saves around 432 exits and entries from these bathrooms and these apartments or houses each time, each time we use these ones. So it's, you know, that increases safety and also increases quality. So this is great for, for our business and it's great for our customers. As well, it's great for reducing waste because if you can put the waste, can you, if you can put um, manufacture in a place that's, you know, controlled and, um, you know, is going to be much more efficient, for example, site prefab. So another component of the half development waste target is to have some pilot projects. So we've nominated two projects, one in New South Wales, Willoughby, 
um, Project One, which is on the old Channel 9 site, if people know New South Wales, and also one in Victoria, Tullamore Building C, which is another small apartment project. And we've set a target for these projects. Let's do everything we can to try and halve development waste. So um, what does that mean, halving development waste? We had to actually try and go through our data to try and find some benchmarks. So in terms of benchmarks, there's showing a few different ways you can measure waste in terms of you know, the size of a building. But the one that really sticks out to me and sticks out and seems to you know, resonate with people is that currently our business as usual is 10 tonnes of waste per apartment. And so we're going to be targeting five you know, and just see how close we can get to that and all the learnings that can, can come from that. So strategy two, I'll just touch on this quickly because it's so important. We've got a target to procure 25% recycled content. Now, this is one of the targets where we're just on the start of a journey. And so I'll just talk through what we're going to do rather than what we have done. So this year, this financial year, we've set a target to set a baseline to really understand our projects and what is our um, baseline in the key materials um, in terms of recycled content and then set our priority materials. Obviously things um, with high volume and costs, for example, steel and concrete are important, but they're also the ones where there's big opportunity, for example, insulation, such as rock walls. Uh, we're gonna work with suppliers and we've had some really positive discussions with suppliers who are you know, keen to work with us on this. And also importantly, we need to develop the measurement and reporting and try and work with our suppliers to get standardized measurement and reporting as well. So innovative construction is the, is the third and last target that I'll talk about. So zero waste to landfill by 2030. So we're going to try um, and do a lot of off-site assembly and efficient construction is the key one. So, um, so this, is just, this, is just, this is just one example we did this year. We did for um, a housing, a small housing project. There was eight house, townhouses being built. They're all identical. We decided to do four townhouses conventionally built you know, the way you would normally build it, four townhouses with some prefab elements, particularly the floors and um, the walls. So uh, we did that and we found, we were surprised, we spent a lot of time collecting the data and making sure it being robust in the way we collected data. And we found it had so many business benefits as well as producing 50% less waste, which is what we were hoping for. So it shows that we can be done using prefab and efficient construction that we can have our development waste, which was very exciting, as well as being faster, less risky um, and the same quality for the same cost. The other thing that we're gonna be doing as part of efficient construction is engaging with our supply chain, which is critical. So we've done some um, analysis of our materials that are reported that go to land, or go, that are taken by off site by our waste companies at the moment. And we've realized that there's actually only six key materials that make up 90% of our waste. And so that really helps us to now, you know, go to our supply chain and say, well, you know, concrete suppliers, timber suppliers, metal, plasterboard, we really want to work with you to how we can, um, I guess, purchase and procure and manage our materials on our construction site more efficiently um, to reduce the waste that we, that we generate. So um, and, we've, and we've had some discussions with some of our key suppliers and it's been had some really positive discussions and looking forward to working with them further. So now I'll hand over to Kim to talk about the next strategies. Uh, thanks, Naomi. It's going to be a hard act to follow, I might add. Um, I'm the resource recovery manager, so I look after the nuts and bolts of the everyday operations of our office buildings and retail centres. Um, my key strategy, I suppose, that we're talking about today is strategy four, efficient and responsible operation. Um, there's three actions involved in that, which we'll talk to the main one. Uh, the first one is engage and educate. Um, we need to learn and understand the waste uh, that is being generated and used at our assets. Uh, we need to understand and incentivize um, our tenants and, and their behaviors. And, and whether that's a carrot or a stick, <laughs> we're still trying to work out the, the, the best and the most efficient way of bringing people on board to ensure that they understand that they can make a difference in this journey. Uh, we need to ensure that our philosophy is to avoid waste in the first place. Um, and to guide tenants to make better procurement decisions, to investigate all options, talk to the suppliers. In the few discussions that we've had to date in the last month or so, it's evident that some of these suppliers haven't been asked too many questions about recycled content, which was a surprise to us. Um, but they're certainly understanding that we're, um, you know, to, to remain as one of our suppliers, they will need to, to come on board with this and be able to answer the questions, uh, not just about certification, um, but about that recycled content and, and the verification behind that uh, promotion of that material. Uh, just on that, the value of materials and circular economy thinking is critical. 
we need to get away from the fact that we're, we're talking about waste. We need to be talking about the commodity and the value of that. And that's a mindset and behavioral um, thing that we found. Uh, implement source separation and best practices to reduce contamination uh, across the board. And I'll talk about some of our audits that we've done in a moment, but um, people need to understand what can go into uh, which bin. And there's a lot of confusion still out there, certainly in Australia. And there's a mindset as well that um, it's not that in Australia at the moment, we're not recycling. So we need to reassure and get the trust of our customers and tenants to ensure that, that, is, that we've got the due diligence in, in place to make sure that that waste management process is going to um, achieve the maximum recovery outcomes, whether that's through reuse, recovery or repurpose. Naomi? Um, so uh, part of the achievements that we've achieved to date and uh, Jackie, um, Jackie's company Edge have been um, appointed as our consultants in a, a bin trim EPA New South Wales um, project, about 295K was granted um, to us. Uh, to engage our New South Wales retail assets. Uh, this is tracking along nicely. Um, the focus is um, the, um, to assess the tenant's behaviour and requirements. The focus is on organic CDS, soft plastics, and, and actually engaging the tenants and just getting their feedback. And then establishing an action plan and move to implementation for those improvements. We're also talking to our suppliers um, and they've committed to conduct biannual surveys and desktop analysis to look at what waste is being uh, generated by the tenants again, just to reiterate and uh, continue the education program from what the bin trim is going to provide for us. At the sites where we've uh, conducted these um, surveys to date, we've doubled organics um, at uh, several sites. We've identified um, an unusual um, stream, which is hair collections from salons, which can go to our Brisbane New Grow facility to be treated. We've increased soft plastics and CDS opportunities and site-specific improvements like dock design, equipment, et cetera, on site. It comes back to basics, and I know it, it is nuts and bolts, but simplicity, colour coding and positive messaging. Um, gamification is a bit, bit of a buzzword out there. How can we make this more fun to reduce that contamination? And as a plan B, in some of our buildings where we have very high contamination rates, we've actually um, engaged the cleaners to, to remove the contamination quite a costly exercise, um, but that doesn't take away from the responsibility for each of us to do the right thing as a first user. And we've conducted some con contamination audits and general waste audits as well, which if we go to the next slide, uh, Naomi. So the, um, the general waste audit, we've um, used a uh, social enterprise called Green Connect. Um, they're a, a company based in um, South Coast that keeps waste out of landfill and creates jobs uh, opportunities for re settled refugees. It was to look at what is in the landfill stream. If we are going to remove our red bins, uh, we need to understand what's what's going into that um, stream. And when we talk about problem waste, anything that's going into that landfill stream, I we identify as a problem waste stream. The, the actual audit looked at recyclables, organics, energy recovery, and prob problem and residual waste. And you can see there that a staggering 99.3% of the landfill that what had been placed into the landfill could have been diverted through either recycling, food, organics, energy recovery, or those problem waste streams. And then from that, the results of that audit, and that's just a graph on the right side that kind of shows you um, what, the, what that looks like. And from that, our action plan is to drive tenant engagement and education to change behaviors um, and to, to look at the value of this circular economy. We also, if you move on to the next one, we also, that's just a, a photograph. It was a huge team uh, that came to site. Um, we've done this at a few, COVID has interrupted this. Um, we hope to do at least another four of these in our Sydney assets over the next um, six months, but um, kind of um, being disrupted at a moment, for the moment with um, COVID. But you can see there on the right-hand side, it, it was the, the equivalent to three overflowing uh, 660 litre bins that uh, resulted in, by the time they removed that, it was one small bag everything else could have been diverted. If we look at the, um, and there's, there's um, this is an example of a contamination audit uh, that we've done where we've got a pre-sort in place. One of the big demotivators when we talk to our tenants is that they believe that when the cleaners, when they collect the waste, throw it all into one trolley. And you can see there that may be the case, but there are processes that we drive and KPIs that we drive behind that with, through color coding of bags and bins, et cetera. Um, and the cleaners, then it's their responsibility and scope to actually separate that waste stream, um, take out the, uh, the contaminants 
and you can see there before the sort there was the of the um or the, of the recycling that was brought down from the tenancies 54 percent uh, sorry 54.7 percent of that was contaminated post sort it was zero percent so a huge result we need to have that have that happening on the floors rather than depend on a cleaner uh, or someone else to to fix our mistakes next one sorry um, action two is to increase, increase accountability. Look, we're, we're looking at uh, national standards, uh, standards across our waste um, contracts, um, ensuring that we've got very robust um, KPIs and uh, defined roles and responsibilities, including um, w, uh, waste management plans and our leasing, looking at how we can change our leasing to, or at least amend our leasing to ensure that people uh, and our tenants are held accountable uh, for the waste that they're generating. Looking at the due diligence and the data integrity, performance and outcomes through stakeholder meetings, um, and looking at technology with our suppliers to, to look for that um, innovation. Um, and since we've released our white paper, we've been contacted by quite a few various businesses that have got ideas on how they can um, help us achieve our goals. And then the automated and digital education material, which is quite critical at the moment in COVID times where everything is online looking at how we can improve that uh, to simplify that message as well. Uh, just removing the red bins, um, what does that look like? Um, can we imagine that? Could we do it in our home or our work um, workspace? Um, we need to change our behaviour and what would, what would happen if we had to pay to use a red bin? There's lots of advantages to pay as you throw. There is a certainly, um, this is um, occurring already in Europe. Um, it can increase the separation, achieve energy savings, reduce um, pollution, and encourage producers to develop and design um, more environmentally friendly products. Naomi, sorry. User pays, one of the challenges there is um, to move to a user pay system. We need to have robust uh, processes in place uh, to measure by tenancy level waste stream, costs, associated costs for the actual systems and the uh, the cleaner resources is anywhere between 45 and 100k per annum. We need to comply to the um, Australian National Trade Measurements Reg Regulation and reconciliation of the sources of data. Just an example there of um, one site where we've looked at, we've got three sources of data, a smart compactor, which uses swipe cards, Waybridge dockets, which is a source of truth, um, and then the cleaner's weights. And you can see there's quite a substantial difference between the, the, the three sets of data. We need to address those issues and we're talking to the suppliers, we're talking to uh, consultants, et cetera, to see where we can um, make some rate, um, inroads there. Uh, one of the examples is a system uh, that uh, the cleaners use to actually weigh the waste um, on the right-hand side there. And I know I'm running out of time, guys, so just quickly, Naomi, go to the next one, if that's all right. Uh, collaborate to, to enable the circular economy. Uh, we're looking at the whole of material, uh, life material use, where we can make the biggest impact set measurable milestones um, and inspire wider action. Um, and as Jackie said, it can't happen in isolation. It requires a, a shift and structural changes and we can't lose um, sight of that end goal. We need to work collaboratively with our peers, partners and suppliers um, to transform mindsets and the, the current waste cycle. Just, um, and we've, we're looking at organics uh, to avoid waste in the first place, build a hierarchy across our assets um, recycle compost, compost, look for those circular economy processes where we can buy back compost and uh, donate to community gardens. We've had some great success stories. And we've got an example of a fruit shop where discounts used by date fruit and veggies, gives polystyrene to a neighbouring um, fish market, uh, returns a wax cardboard to a supplier and donates 200 to 300 kilograms to local farmers. So another good news story and the waste that that fruit shop is generating is, is quite minimal and quite quite surprising and impressive. Just next one. Um, just some examples of where we've been looking for innovative um, ideas. Um, source separations um, who create bins have now got a product that is made from 100% recycled Australian post-consumer plastics. And we've been able to, to look for, through our um, social enterprises, we've been able to find a solution to some problem waste streams that otherwise would have gone to landfill and would have been quite costly um, to dispose of. And we were able to donate them to a, a very a, a, a funky uh, <laughs> uh, restaurant uh, at, um, I think it's Marrickville called Field and Finn. So great, um, great results there. And then just finally, um, Mates on the move, again, we can't reiterate the importance of use, you know, using social enterprises and the social impact is a very important part of the circular, circular economy. 
mates on the move. We had a, an office building that had a huge amount of furniture. They actually put it on Facebook and were able to um, help us to donate uh, a lot of the items to various um, projects um, around Sydney, including um, a COVID testing unit with some office chairs, et cetera. So we had some very good results there. And um, again, the social impact of that. And then just Naomi, finally, the last slide, just looking at, uh, they were able to donate 89 chairs, uh, 164 items of e-waste um, and various office waste and the feedback from the community. They took their truck, they donated their time and they emptied the truck within 45 minutes to very, very impressed and very um, appreciative um, local community members. And I think that's it for me. So sorry about that, I've gone over time.